Welcome. Good afternoon for those of you here in Hawaii, evening for those of you elsewhere, and maybe morning for those of you in yet other places. Thank you so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Love to have you with us for more candid discussions, difficult conversations to make good trouble with some wonderful people to do that with. Hey, in no particular order, retired Judge Sandra Sims, an author working on her second book, hey, and very strong community activist and community service orientation. Hey, Tina Patterson in Maryland with entrepreneurial background, arbitration, mediation, conflict resolution background, hey, and Ben Davis in Charlottesville, Virginia, of all places, after years teaching at the University of Toledo School of Law, and then recently at the University of Illinois Chicago Campus School of Law, and now at Washington and Lee in Virginia. And also well known for international experience and expertise, including in Paris and other European locations. So welcome all of you. And Sandra, you very kindly offered to start us off with a poem from a sister in Ghana, right? In Ghana. And it's in honor of, uh, thanks, uh, Chuck. And uh, this is uh, really a, a, a quite a week that we're beginning. Um, there's so much going on in the world. I'm, I'm sort of feeling a bit, you know, disconnected and dis disoriented, like so many people are. But I was uh, in, in, involved in a project with my um, local links chapter. We did a partnership with a group of women poets in Ghana. Uh, and we did a poetry exchange where each of us would write a poem and then the other would pick up from that poem and continue with another. It was a project that uh, lasted several months and it ended up, public we published a book called Sisters Across Oceans. And uh, it was uh, edited by Dr. Uh, Catherine Takara, uh, who in Hawaii is a well-known author and professor and, and uh, publisher of a, a number of books. So the poem I'm reading is called Words. And the author is Celestine Nudanu. And she, is a, uh, she has published an anthology of, of haiku in Ghana. Uh, and several several poetry books, but this was the poem that she wrote uh, for this exchange. And her poem began with the last line of her partner's poem, which was, "No man should be should be silenced with a knee." And the title of the poem is "Words." And let me put my glasses on so I can really see it. <laughs> no man should be silenced with a knee, nor with guns, nor with a word. For the freedom to breathe is a given and freedom to express should be free like the very air we breathe. Words are powerful, so is silence. And so is the will to be heard above the den of the silence. When silence becomes golden, it loses its luster as one people all over our words must be the voice for the voiceless. As poets, our words must break taboos, crack whips and ceilings, reach out, unbend those knees that stifle the very air that we breathe. For breathe, we must. That's, it. That's lovely. And what a great way to start off honoring International Women's Day week. <clears throat> The theme this year, we're all wearing purple to honor International Women's Day. Sandra's even taken it to another dimension <laughs> through, the, through the purple lens. And my, maybe that's what we should have called it. <laughs> and the theme of this year, correct me if I got it wrong, Tina, is breaking the bias, right? Breaking the bias. What do you that think is, that's yeah. intended to evoke? The theme Break the Bias, it's actually um, six points involved in the Break the Bias theme for this year. And it's related to inclusion and encouragement for women um, to be considered part of society. And I, I'm gonna share with you the, the, the six areas that were um, outlined. One is building workplaces where women thrive. The 
The second is elevating women um, creatives. The third is improving equality for women in technology. The fourth is empowering women's choices in health. Number five is celebrating women foraging change, excuse me, foraging change. And the sixth is foraging women's empowerment worldwide. And as was read in the poem, um, this is an example of women creatives, speaking, giving truth, um, making, making uncomfortable conversations part of our dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, breaking the bias can be interpreted in a number of ways. I, attended a webinar a few days ago and it was related to specifically women in, in law. And it was talking about bringing women associates and how, how do you make them partner? How do you encourage that career path? But it also applies, and I thought about this as someone who has been in the information technology field for years, opening that door and saying, you, know, you can do that. You can be that computer programmer, you can be that product manager, you can be that VP or that CIO or that CTO that's leading a team and you look around the room and you're the only woman in the room and garner the respect. And it, you know, I've heard in the past and I've been talking about International Women's Day now for about 20 years, I thought about it a few days ago and it, it has grown in momentum. And there are some who said, oh, International Women's Day is about putting men down. No, it's not. It's actually about saying, we are a community and it's people like Ben Davis and Chuck Crumpton who make it possible for us to be a community where we all thrive. This is, this is about, again, looking if, using the boat metaphor, when the water rises, all the boats rise. It's not one boat versus another. Mm. So knowing Excellent. you, Tina, Excellent. Those, those six principles, those six platforms, I'm sensing those are key pillars in your life and your motivation as well. Uh, can you pick one or two things that you've really focused in on, really dedicated yourself to uh, that serve those? Goodness. Um, well, I have really been focused on um, empowering women, whether that's women who I work with, women who report to me, or women in the community. Um, giving them voice, giving them the support, making those networks, making the introductions. Sometimes it's that voice of encouragement or that person who's just sitting in the room and saying, you can do this. Mm -hmm. um, when, the, when there are uh, people around you who are telling you for whatever reason, you can't, it's that one small voice that you need says you can do this. And I endeavor to be that. Um, sometimes it's not through words, sometimes it's through actions, just showing up. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sometimes being that person who says, um, how's it going? Yeah. It is making yeah. that, that donation. There's a young lady that I think of that when I lived in the North Texas area was very much interested in the United Nations and she was in school and she wanted to attend a conference and I didn't tell her, but I paid her conference fee, her entrance fee. And she said, you know, I got a phone call and someone paid for my entrance fee. Do you know anything about that? Okay, I'm going to say it publicly. I lied and told you her lied. I didn't. And I did know. <laughs> um, but I wanted her to go because this mm -hmm. was a once in a lifetime experience. And from there, she has gotten much further involved in, in pursuing her dream. And, and that's what the, the empowerment's about, pursuing that dream where others are saying you can't. Say you can. You can. Exactly. Hey. Exactly. If I recall correctly, Tina, that's been true for you as well, right? Oh, absolutely. A... Absolutely. So, I wouldn't be yeah. here if it weren't for others. And, and it, today is especially poignant for me because if my grandmother were alive today, today's her birthday, um, mm. she'd be 95, 96 years old, and I wouldn't be here because of her. Um, you know, so it's, it's, paying it forward, but also remembering where I came from. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And I think that's an important phrase. It became kind of maybe even overused a little while ago, but maybe it's a good time to bring it back that for people to devote themselves to paying forward those six pillars, those six principles. Yes. And Sandra, Absolutely. you had some thoughts. 
I, you know, when, as she was, as Tina was describing that and, you know, going through her experience, I, 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 I'm a little older, so I, I wrote my letter this week to uh, our senatorial um, representatives, my letter of support uh, for uh, justice to be, justice to be uh, Kentaji Jackson Brown. And it was a very, very emotional thing for me when I heard the announcement that he, that, you know, President Biden had nominated her, I cried. Mm. I was stunned that it had that much of an emotional impact on me. You know, we'd been hearing about him talking about doing it and, you know, it's sort of a, okay, he could, that'll happen. But when it was actually said, you know, it hit me in a place that I just did not think it would. And, and it had to do when I, and when I wrote to Senator uh, Hirono, I, I explained that to her. Mm -hmm. uh, we're both from that generation. I started law school in the seventies and there were very few women. There were very few, um, you know, folks of color, maybe very few black folks. And um, models that we had, like you, you talked Tina about, you know, really honoring those have, that have paid that price were people like um, Judge Mott, Constance Baker Motley and um, to, you know, for here in Hawaii, for, for Patsy Mink and Pat Psyche and Judge Batu, there were so few. And to think that we have come to this place because these women, you know, we were always the, I know from my career, my entire career has pretty much been you know, being the first, then the only, the first and the only as, as Senator Hirono, that's her, been her experience. And so many of the, you know, women that I know who are of this time, we're, you know, breaking out, going through all kinds of barriers and cracking doors open and so forth. And so when I wrote that to her, I said, I, it was just, it was a very, very emotional thing to feel like at this moment, there is actually going to be the very real possibility that a black woman, a black woman will be named to the United States Supreme Court. And I told her that when she is confirmed and sworn in, I'll cry again. Uh, it's that, it, you know, for, like I said, for the time that I've, I've been a part, it's just, there've been so many barriers, like Tina has mentioned that, you know, that, um, we had to break through. And again, so many allies and people who have assisted along the way. And certainly now uh, we're in that position. I am, Tina, Ben, all of you are in that position now to really pay it forward. And that's, and that's, that's what's happening. And it is so of the horrid things that are taking place. That is the one thing that is really, really heartwarming to see is to see, um, so many women helping women, so many women's organizations uh, raising money. We're about to do our thing with Sir Optimus in a few weeks. We're just learned that we are on that day, we're going to be presenting something like 20 awards. Uh, we're looking at $50,000 being distributed to help women uh, pursue their dreams. And it is, it is so exciting. Uh, and uh, as we look at International Women's Day in March being Women's History Month, it really is a time, you know, to look at those ideals and those and those principles and do our part, continue to do our part, uh, being grateful for those that have opened paths and doors for me. Uh, I, I think about that. Um, and that the, the biggest door that was open for me uh, was from Justice Hayashi. Um, I was a law clerk for Justice Hayashi, who was uh, uh, chief judge for the Intermediate Court of Appeals uh, here in, in, in Hawaii. And again, like you say, there's you there are the allies and they are there. They've always been there. And so that's just my story for today. I'm a little emotional about that, though. Mm. With, with good reason. Yeah, well, Ben, you've been a scholar and professor on the Constitution and the courts and all things related for decades now. What's most striking, most impressive to you about the nomination of Judge Jackson at this time in this way? 
uh, you know, it, it, it's funny. I, I had a, I listened to a, a program in honor of a, a very great scholar, Carrie Michael Meadow, uh, the, the, uh, the Texas A&M had on Friday. David Wilkins spoke about some of the surveys in the legal profession. And there was one thing that struck me in particular in what he said, which was it was sort of surveys of black women lawyers were showing um, a generally a great satisfaction with the substance of the work they were doing, but a dissatisfaction with the rewards they got for that work. It was like a discontinuity. I thought it was a really interesting a disconnect way yeah. to describe mm -hmm. this sort of way. And so part of me looks at uh, her nomination as being, I assume that she was raised on the, you have to work twice as hard to get half as far. Absolutely. Mantra, right? Absolutely. And to be where she is, I have to think of just what was the twice as far, twice as hard, if this is half as far for her, you know, and, and this like how extraordinary she truly, she truly is. And at the same time, I also have this feeling like uh, there, particularly uh, for black women, I would think, but that there's a sense of, um, the substance of the work she enjoys and the rewards that she will get will finally be about equal. I mean, they were already good at the court of appeals level at the DC circuit, you know, but it's like, this is someone who managed to get both of those things, which yeah. has been so hard for a lot of people to actually get, you know, and you hear about the people leaving the profession at various points and times, uh, especially in the, uh, and big law and things like that. And yeah. So that's, yeah. that's kind of, you know, yeah. So I, I just, where, where, you know, the idea that you can get the kind of rewards that you merit and have the pleasure of the work, I think is a, kind of a message I get from her for anyone who's out there to maybe go in to see their boss and say, you know, you need to give me a raise, you know, because the, the rewards have to be commensurate with the pleasure of the work, you know. I don't know, but I think that's kind of a thing that struck me about her. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of, yeah, sort of a coming full circle and connecting all the dots and yeah, it's, yeah, it's, that's, you know. yeah, that's an interesting survey. I hadn't seen that survey uh, of uh, women's, black women's level of sort of dissatisfaction with the, but well, particularly in the private firms, I think you see it more yeah. there, but those that yeah. are, have engaged in you know, have chosen, I think, and you're seeing that now too, this kind of pulling away from that and finding ways to be of service. Um, yeah. yeah, That's kind yeah. of the, the, the focus that we're seeing. And Tina, you're certainly a, a huge part of that as well. We're seeing a lot of that. And I know Louise is, was, isn't on today, but, you know, that's certainly a, a, a huge part of, of her work. And, and, and many women, who, women attorneys now, are really, really taking that, um, I don't want to, taking that message back that says service is what is important. Um, mm. I think there may have been a time and probably in my early career where the, because there were so few women and certainly some very few black attorneys as well, that was sort of this push to be a part of this profession in that, you know, in that uh, kind of corporate sense, but also coming to this place of, you know, our core is service. Um, our core is to our communities and to providing that kind of um, um, help that we can give. And that's, that's kind of, that's coming full circle. And, and of course, um, a judiciary career is a part of that. It is service. Mm -hmm. It is absolute service as well. So, yeah. I'm well, you know, the, you know the, uh, I was thinking about uh, some some of the discussion also that day was about the notion of professionalism, right? In your role as a professional, what does that mean? I mean, what is the image of what professionalism is that you're sort of buying into, as opposed to sort of who you are? You know, in other words, you're trying to act like something you're not because you have this vision of professionalism looks like this or that. Uh, um, 
and 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 that you know a lot of times about people uh what was it i think it's oscar wilde's uh quote where it said something like be yourself everyone else is taken <laughs> you know, you know. that's a good one that's a good one that's an absolutely good one <laughs> And, and you know the, the ability to just be yourself, uh, act what you're doing, so there's like a coherence. You know, um, I think that's one of the things that that uh, to me at least resonates from her in the way that she she is. She is who she is. You know, and uh, it's you know there's you get that feeling from different people at different points in times, and and uh, that's a lesson for everyone too. You know, uh, like. Um, but authenticity yeah and authenticity yeah and we're seeing more and more of that uh in the prof not just in the legal professions but in the professions generally i think um you know early on and i guess i'm just sitting here revealing my age but early on there was always this sort of move to be um i don't i don't, I don't like using this term but i can't think of anything else as, but, but to be like the males that were proceeding and, you know, and to, to uh, adopt those standards, kind of putting away the things that are at your, that were at your core, you know, as a, as a, as a female attorney, as a, as a woman. Uh, and I think that's kind of changing a lot, yeah. a lot. I mean, just by looking at the, you know, changing, um, atmosphere in the in the in the uh, workplace with regard to issues like you know child care when i was coming on there's no such thing as child care at the workplace yeah. you know taking care of children was your problem you had to figure that out <laughs> you know, yeah. don't bring that you know that's the that's the time i grew up in it was like don't bring those problems to us you figure it out uh and that's changed so much uh yeah my youngest, my the, the tech person you saw, she <laughs> attended one of the first um, workplace uh, child care centers that was established here in Honolulu uh, yeah. in preschool was at City Hall. Um, that was, well, a very long time ago. <laughs> but no, no, it wasn't that long ago, actually. So that was just beginning. I mean, the notion that you would have a child care center at your on the work site itself. Who yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, and I, 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 one of the things that I really love is this idea of uh, having child care at um, assisted living places with with the old folks too. Yeah. The old folks with the kids. I've seen some of those, and it seems to me that that works really well. You know, I mean, for the old folks and for the kids. You know, I mean it. We don't, you know, it's like, why do we think of them separately? You know, it, 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 I don't know. It just was something that moved me. The, just the, the sheer, almost like, you know, I don't know, what is it? Sort of like quasi-grandparent moment for, for a lot yeah. of you know, yeah. towards these kids. And, uh, you know, things like that, you know, that uh, we could change. Lord knows there's got to be a way for this country to figure out that it's got to pay for child care for everybody everywhere you know i mean it's just i hear this i was talking with my students the other day about oh you know spending ten thousand dollars on child care and they're like nope not ten you know that child care is going to be you know twenty five thousand dollars something maybe one full salary of a two income will be just to take care of the child care. i think that's insane you know, it's just, but, but you know, there. I, I lived in France a long time. You know, you'd had to go down to the mayor and kind of talk a little. But there was a place right there in the neighborhood where kids, babies, all the way up to his point of school, you know, could go. And and a big relief for a lot of people uh, with uh, women who were working and uh, and uh, and their husbands too. That there was, you know. We didn't necessarily have the grandparent available, sort of thing. So, but uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're moving. I, hope. I think yeah. with you know, I don't know, Tina. You're probably seeing a lot more of it than than I get to see. But that's that's changing a lot. 
think it is changing. And, and Ben, to your point, um, it's the infrastructure. It's it's how childcare um, is is now considered part of the work infrastructure, whether that is having mm -hmm. a lactation room, a wellness room, whether that's having daycare on site, but it's also saying, um, I have to go pick up my child. And yeah. no one yeah. says, well, how old is your child? And that's not, that's not the issue. The issue is I've got to go pick up my child or, you know, I, I need to be off camera. My child is not feeling right now. And, and that is becoming more the norm and less of the, the anomaly. And so mm -hmm. I think we're getting there. It's the, the pressure, as you mentioned, Sandra, to be one of the guys and instead saying, you know, this is who I am. This is who I am authentically. Um, and coming to the table with that. It, it's no longer a matter of there's this, there's still the standard that people are looking for, but the pressure to be cookie cutter. And I'll pause because Chuck, it looks like you want to say something. Hey. No, we're just we're into our last couple of minutes. I want to give Ben a chance to share with oh, us. Wow, that was poem. fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. But I wanted to thank you for incredibly important insights that what we're really talking about and what the six principles Tina articulated and the nomination of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson represents Hey, and the other highlights that you brought out is connecting the core values and the core choices in the ways that they need to be after four years in which we saw the opposite, whatever your politics may be. And one of the things that's striking is before Judge Jackson's nomination, Senator Lindsey Graham went out and he said, you know, I could really get behind this potential nominee from uh, North Carolina here in my state. And uh, if that's the nomination, I can pretty much assure that'll come through. If it's not, it's going to be a whole different picture here. That didn't work. The right choice for the right reason reflecting the right values was the choice that was made. And I want to suggest that behind that and at the core of that, I believe, probably were both the First Lady and our vice president. Yeah. So Ben, do you have Maya Angelou's poem ready for us? Well, I'm going to say this is for the judges. She goes through her confirmation hearings and all the craziness is thrown at her because there will be craziness. See, just mm -hmm. the marriage, just wait mm -hmm. for it, just to watch it. I see. Mm -hmm. Maybe just whispering this into her ear if she's listening in the uh, ether. Uh, you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust I will rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I will rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame I rise, up from a past that's rooted in pain I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear I rise, into a daybreak that's wondrously clear I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Woo. And thank you so much. Thank you all. <laughs> Judge Jackson, may you soon become Justice Jackson. Tina, Sandra, Ben, thanks. Guests, listeners, come back and join us again in a couple of weeks. Thanks for being with us. Take care. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, brother.
Aloha. Best to everyone. All right.